Hello, I'm Senior Grandmaster Jimenez from Kaja Kimbo Live, coming from South Lake Tahoe, California. I have a special guest today. I have Professor Terry Faircloth from um, Washington, and uh, it's going to be a great interview. Uh, Terry, um, are you on the line? I am here. All right, Professor. How's Thank everything you. going? How's everything going over there? <laughs> it's going great. Yeah, <laughs> the weather's doing good and everything. Yeah, finally. Yeah, finally. That's pretty good. So um, we're going to ask you a few questions. Um, so tell me, um, um, how old were you when you uh, started the martial arts, and, and tell me what style you started with. Um, I was 18. I had moved over to the area I'm in now from Yakima, which is about 200 miles away. And um, um, my friend came over and said, you got to go see this movie with me. And so I did, and it was Chuck Norris. Good guys were black, and uh -huh. it was 1978. And um, the next day, him and I went searching for a school, mm -hmm. and um, I came across a couple. We went to a couple schools, Taekwondo and uh, traditional, and then I, then we came to this little school, and it was um, a Kaji Kimmel school. We didn't know it at the time, and I met um, a Sifu Joe Clark, and. Um, and from just talking to him and, <laughs> and seeing what you just, it was crazy. Um, I, we signed up right then. Yeah, I heard stories uh, I about him. <laughs> he, he was sitting on his desk, and my friend Danny was sitting next to him on his desk. And um, I was sitting in a chair straight across from him, and I said something like, um, something stupid, like, what would you do if we attacked you right now? And, oh, my and God. He, he did he didn't even look at Danny. He just chopped him in the throat and said he'd be dead and you wouldn't get out of the chair. <laughs> and that was all he had to say. That was signing me up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what a question to ask. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> how funny. Yeah. Well, uh, how old are you anyway? I was 18 then. No, no. How old are you now? I'm 62. I'll be 63 in, in like two weeks. Oh, you're, you're the same age as me. Well, you're a little bit older than me. I'll, I'll be 63 in January. But uh, it's funny. I you don't said, look it. And, uh, yeah, no, you don't look it. But um, it was funny because uh, you said about the first movie was Chuck Norris movie. Um, the first karate movie I've ever seen, I was on a little kid. And I don't know if you remember this movie. It was kind of those Chinese movies that the guys fly through the air. It was uh, called Five Fingers of Death. And my, That's my first movie I ever saw. Huh? That's the first movie I ever saw. Was it? Yeah. And my dad took me to no see... Kidding. Yeah, my, really. And my dad took me to see that, and I was like, oh, my God. So then I'm thinking, I want to learn how to do that, fly through the air, which, you know, I'm na <laughs> naive, right? And that's what kind of got me into it. And then all of a sudden the Bruce Lee movies came out, and then that was it. But, yeah, that was the first <laughs> movie that got me going was Five Fingers of Death. And it was, it was, it was all wow. subtitle, you know, so I had to read it. That was pretty good. Um... So then, um, tell me about your your school you had. You had a, a nice studio, I heard. Yeah, it, it um, it it took me a long time to um, get it there. You know, um, I, I I didn't know what I was gonna do. Uh, you know, I mean, I studied I studied, and when I was getting close to my my black belt, um, my Sifu moved to Florida, so there was a and one of his top students took over, and um, that was a blessing because it, he allowed me to um, create things, you know, uh, change things, which worked really good for me. And um, mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, I got my black belt, and he he left. He just handed me the school and said, "It's all yours." And I'm like, huh? "So that's when I decided maybe I want to do this for a living." You know, I don't know why. Right. I had a good job. Uh, I had a good job. I had a, a mobile home on a piece of property. Life was kind of good already, but when I I don't know, I taught a couple times and I like it. You know, seeing people get it, and um, so I decided. You know, I want to do this. I want to do this for uh, full time. Yeah, and uh, I. I went to, I thought, I, I had to think about this for a minute because I never taught in front of people. I never 
had any business experience. Mm-hmm. So I thought long and hard, do I want to do this? Because I'm probably going to lose everything I have. Mm-hmm. Um, but you but you would never do until you tried. You know, so I, I, I went down and I, I, I talked to a health club and I made a, uh, an agreement with them that if I could come there and teach there every day, bring my students with me, that I would teach their members free. Mm-hmm. And in, the, in return, I would learn everything I could about the health club, yeah. how, they, how they operate, how, they, how, they, how they're in business, you know. And, and I had a plan for, for a year and a half to do that. And then, then I figured I would – I went in there with 18 students, and um, my plan was teach their members for free. And when I left, I knew their, mem- their, their members would follow me if they were my students. Mm-hmm. And so in that year and a half, I learned how the health club worked. I learned yeah. how to market myself. I learned how to market the art. And um, I, a year and a half, I left. I left with um, 60 students. Yeah, good stuff. I went in there with 18 and left with 60. Uh-huh. And yeah. um, and so the journey started, you know, and I, I bought my old school back. And it was just um, trial and error, you know, for the first 10 years. But I was, you know, I, I watched everything I owned disappear. But, you know, yeah. that's the way it happens. And, um, but I started by my five-year mark. I had um, turned it around. Yeah. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I mean, I, I'm... People think have this attitude of um, if you teach martial arts, you got to be poor, and it, it's just so wrong because it, it's like going to college. You go to college to come out to make get a good job to make money to yeah. live. And I, I was into martial arts to also I want to make a good living at it. Sure. And um, so many do. You know, <laughs> for so you know I had to bust my butt all day because I was like this ugly duckling of uh, the black belt I felt. But um, being at the health club, it allowed me to go study different arts. So I started studying Arnis, and at the same time, I hooked up with um, Al Dacascos, Cecil Al Dacascos, and um, one half know yeah. he was in Oregon. And um, so I was um, when I so I moved my, to my school. I was full time. I shot down uh, when I could to Oregon. I brought Cecil Al up and um, was learning one half know concepts. And um, my first black belt was in the Chan Fa branch of Kaj Kimball. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I just started, you know, juggling it all, teaching, training, training, teaching. And um, by my five-year mark, I was, um, I, like I said, I, I started turn, turning around to where I can remember calling up a few for a while saying, I made $2,000 this month. I was like, you know, ecstatic. That was your first mistake. (laughs) You know, his reaction was, well, that's that's good, Terry, but I couldn't live on that a week. (laughs) And and when I heard that, it it did something. And from that day on, from that month on, I don't think I ever made less than 2,000 a week. Yeah. Just, there's a method to do it. I know. And um, for the business side, you know, because you could be a good black belt, and not be a good teacher. Yeah. You could be a good teacher, but not a good businessman. Exactly. Uh, you got to be able to get good on all three of those yes. to run, have a good school. And it took me, like I said, quite a few, quite a few years before um, before you know, two thousand a week sounds like a lot, and it, it is. But it's the more you end up spending, because you got to get a bigger building, you know, mm-hmm. et cetera, et cetera. So. You know, it all kind of balanced out. But my tenth year is when I was doing really good, and um, and my school was um, the key is having good skilled students is where the key is, yeah. and um, and that's what brings people in. That's what that you know, go to tournaments, get exposure, and and you know, do your, do your best. You know, I taught every student, every class. No green belts ever taught class. Yeah, that's um, good. The key is just staying, staying on it and wanting to be getting your students the best that you can get them. Sure. So by, so by my, um, I'd say by my 10th year, I think my school is 
and it was doing really well, over six figures a year. So, and then by my twelfth year, it was at about one seventy a year. That's good. Um, which is pretty, pretty good for yeah. a kung fu school. You know, and, uh, uh, when uh, but it was all it was all because it was a student first. Yeah, it wasn't. I didn't have three hundred students. I had a hundred students, but it was how you how you do it. There's a method to it. Yep. And it's not um, I, it's not looking at it like okay, a student and so much a month. That's how a lot of people look at it. Mm-hmm. And, and um, I didn't do it that way. I looked at it like just the student skills, and I had a I had it set up to where there's having a company do my um, student. I didn't have students make payments to me. Did you have Adam, Did you have educational funding Adam, company? Yeah, I had them to a funding company. Yeah, I, I had so, the same thing. That is so good because yeah. you don't have any. They do all the. You don't have to be the bad guy. All, they, yeah, they do all your business for yeah. you. So I never looked at the school like that. I didn't even think that check it came in every month. And that was just I just that just went in the bank to pay the bills. The the um it was the other entities I had going in the school that. Mm-hmm. That brought in, uh, uh, you know, mm-hmm. uh, an abundance, and um, and that kept me busy. You know, I, I mean, always busy. Yeah, my, my, my peak, busy. I had about four hundred students, and uh, education, wow. f- educational funding company collected my money, and they and they said, you know, how it works. They send you a check once a month and stuff like that. Um, but you know, I had, you know. An, <laughs> I was lucky. I had a you know a, a, a staff of eight black belts to help me teach. I had four secretaries. You know, I had you know three different wow. offices going at the same time, and uh, myself and uh, Grandmaster Baco. It, you know, we'd sign the people up, and um, every night it, we'd sign up at least ten a night. You know, and it was just like, and it be, because you have to on the on the mat, you have to be a karate guy. When you go in the office, you're a business guy. Totally. Yeah, that's how it works. Totally. You know. I had this. Um, I had a method down to where you know how people call you and they they um, come in or they just walk in. So they come in. They they want to ask questions sure. and um, they always want to. Can we watch class? Mm-hmm. And um, I I would not let them watch class. I would um, turn them on to something better than that. And that would be um, three half hour sessions that they get to come in and, and experience. Sure. It, yeah. You know and. And so I do the same thing. That was, yeah. And then it's how you uh, operate those three half hour mm-hmm. lessons. Where I wouldn't yeah. do them. Um, somebody would do them, and they would get to see me teach, and etc. And they learned about etiquette, and they learned about you know bowing in, sure. bowing out, and um, <coughs> excuse me. And uh, my my voice is a little bit it's harsh true. from. <laughs> having class today, oh, yeah. but um, anyway, it, it worked really good. I mean, those three half hour sessions were almost a hundred percent people wanting in, signing them up. Yeah. And, uh, but I never really had over. I think the most students I ever had was a hundred and twenty, but the, but the, and, and I taught ninety percent adults. And um, mm-hmm. well, well, let uh, me tell you though, I had four hundred students. Think? That didn't mean 400 students paid me, because right. uh, I I had a thing. I, I it was just from because of me. I had a thing that um, if I knew the the parent or the child couldn't or the person couldn't afford their lessons, I never let them. I never let them quit. I just told them keep coming in, you know. So I had a, I had a lot of wow. students that that didn't pay me, um, and they were like you know 13 years old. In fact, one just thanked me the other day. She's a doctor now. She goes, you know, Sifu. She goes. I remember when my mom was a single mom and we couldn't afford it, and you told us just come anyway. He goes, he goes. My mom came home, went home and cried. Did they stay? Did they stay with you? Yeah, yeah. Wow, that's awesome. Now, that, now the ones that I knew could afford it and were just being with cheap asses and stuff like that, and just went, you know, then I sent them to collector agency. But the ones that I knew that 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 couldn't afford it, every time I never never turned anybody away. I I always said no, you come in. You know, that that was looking for, you know, that was always had signed up already, you know, because... My experience, maybe it's just a difference in areas we, we're in, but if, if students 
um, when they couldn't afford it, and they wanted to, and I, the minute I, it seemed like the minute I let them trade it off, you know, like work or do something, yeah, it seemed like I always lost them anyway. Um, but the, but when they when they did pay, they never missed class because yeah, they had to, you sure. know, they're after they want to get their value. Yeah, um, but I think it a lot of it has to do with areas, you know that. Well, that see, see and plus, up to be honest with you, I was a little, a little fortunate because um, I owned the building and I had no rent. It was all paid for. Oh, wow. So That makes a big difference. That makes a big difference. I mean, if I had to pay four or $5,000 a month rent, well, then I probably would, you know, I couldn't do that. But since I was, you know, I was fortunate, I, I just brought it on, you know, to them, you know, so they could be That's there. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. Let me, let me ask you a couple election. of questions. Um in a, in a short version, how the how the tournaments go for you when you comp- used to compete years ago? <laughs> we um we did really good. I mean, we um I don't want to sound boastful. No, at all. I, this is what Vargas said. I, I should always say that. And senior grandmaster Vargas would say, "You're not bragging. It's fact." No, but we did. We we if I took thirty students to the tournament. We came home with 35 trophies. Yeah, I know. We see the same thing. <laughs> and, um, but see... And then, and then everybody hates you, too. <laughs> excuse me? Then everybody hates you because you beat everybody. <laughs> uh, uh, the, uh, the other I, people at the tournaments. You, I taught my students, you know, smile a lot, be polite. <laughs> um, and they all had individual, their own individual, individual um, personal form that I taught. Each one. Yeah. Their own tournament form. And... Um, so they, they didn't look like another student. They all had their own forms, and um, they would train hard on them, and I would be right with them on them. Yeah. And well, well I, I saw yeah. the I saw the videos of you and your students competing. You guys did a great job. Yeah, we we were fortunate. Mm-hmm. Uh, we took I think I think we won seventeen in a row outstanding dojo awards. Wow. And it, it was awesome, you know. Just, just um, as far as exposure and you know me, I, I don't. I, I like seeing my students win. I'm sure every teacher does. Oh sure, you know, they like your kids. Well, see, that's and, with me. See, when I when I stopped competing, it wasn't because I was too old. It was because I got more enjoyment watching my students than than myself. For me, yeah, myself, I never competed, so I um. Well, I did like three times when I was a brown belt, and um, but I, I did that on purpose because I had to face the, I had to know what it was like before I could teach them what it's gonna be like. Yeah. You know, so you know, I think my my first tournament, I looked up and there was um, Sifu Bob Anderson from the Bellingham School, Kaji Kimmel patch on. I didn't know him at the time, mm-hmm. and uh, my uh, my whole form went out the window. I, I forgot it <laughs> because I was so nervous seeing him there. Yeah. And um, but you know, two other times I made it through, and at least I could take that experience. And I, and um, and I start, and I was able to teach my students how to overcome that and yeah. and how to become winners. Yeah. And I figured this, you know, the hardest division in competition is form. Well, of course, I, I agree, hundred percent. Hundred percent. You're being judged by a little. Five people. Yeah, and you're out there by yourself. You cannot make a mistake. All, all by yourself. Yeah, and I, you, you know, anybody can put the gloves on and go swing away. Yeah. I remember I took, uh, I remember the Kaja Kimbo tournament in the Bay Area, and their first ones, they had uh, their first four in a row. I took grand champion four years in a row. Uh, and I remember wow. my, my, uh, my uh, fourth one, and it was it was kind of like, it was really touching because uh, Grandmaster Gaylord was there, uh, C. Joe was there, uh, Alan Reyes was one of the referees. And I took grand champion, and when they gave me wow. the trophy, I took the microphone. And I said, I, "I won't be comp- uh, defending this next year, but I want to give this trophy to Great Grandmaster Gaylord for all the what he's done for me." And I gave him the trophy in the middle of the auditorium. And I remember he told me after he said, "You know," he says, uh, "I got so many awards from so many people." He goes, "But he goes, this award you gave me, he goes, he goes, it was the best one I cherish because it, 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 it the way you did it." You know, and, and, you know, I remember Alan Reyes, and I used to love Alan Reyes. He, he just looked over me and winked, you know, and CJ, CJ just kind of smirked because he didn't like me. So he just kind of smirked, you know, so. That's awesome. Yeah, it was pretty cool. Um, 
Tell me, okay, I got a question for you, let's say. Sure. Okay, um, I lost my one minute thing here. The, the um, I got my notes right here. The, uh, tell me how you feel about the Grand Masters now and compared to the past. Um, that's a tough question. I know, that's why I'm um, asking you. <laughs> I mean, I respect, you know, I respect all Grandmasters. Um, so do I. You know, because they're at that, they're the, the leaders. Mm -hmm. um, what, I, I don't, that's a hard question man, as far as like <laughs> before, before I respected them too. But at being closer to that level, um, I, I just I just know what I look for in grandmasters. I just make sure that I walk that walk, meaning I I, I believe in being respectful and mm -hmm. um, and walking that that it's very well difficult to see for me. It's very difficult. To, See for me, I'll tell you. See, I was uh, I was taught by senior Grandmaster Vargas, and then Gaylord, of course. So I've been with him since the last you know fifty years, whatever. But <clears throat> senior Grandmaster Vargas was strict. He, we didn't play around in class. You didn't joke around. You didn't act silly. I mean, he, he was strict, right. and he was real traditional. You don't put your belt on the floor. Uh, one of the black belts. I was leave, I'll leave his name out because I don't want to embarrass him, but. Uh, he asked if he can get tested for his purple belt that night. And and Sifu Vargas said, no, you can't. For asking, you'll wait three years. And he kept him a white belt for three years. That's how strict it was. So I was I was accustomed to having that, that you know, the, that's the way we were taught. And I was in Hawaii, uh, you know, a few years ago, and I taught uh, the, the Country Kimba Seminar with that uh, great Grandmaster Luna through and stuff, and all the Grandmasters mm -hmm. were there, too. I got two grandmasters, I'll leave their name out because I don't want to embarrass them, walking around the seminar with a Budweiser in their hand. And they think it's funny. Wow. I, I don't think that's funny. I think that's the, the lowest... I don't think that's funny. Either. No, I think that's the lowest class you can do being a grandmaster. You need to show an example. And and the other other people, make, they think it's funny. Oh, yeah, where's the beer? Well, I don't think that's funny. I, I don't think... After, after the, the seminar, no problem. You guys drink all you want. That's the wine and czar. But when you're at a seminar or you're at a tournament, I don't want to see you holding a Budweiser in your hand or, or, or a can of beer or, you know, that's just, yeah, okay. you know, and that's, that's, that's the difference. Now. That's the difference between now and then. Okay, I, I understand where you're coming from now, yeah. You're yeah. absolutely right. Um, I, in this last few years, I've been exposed to um, a lot of things that I've seen that, that, that I don't like. Sure. Um, I mean, that I just don't like. Uh, um uh, I've always viewed um, being at Grandmaster that that you, you help help lift people up. Sure. Um, you know, give them sound advice. Mm -hmm. um, there's, instead of you know, when I hear Grandmasters slamming someone else, yeah. slamming or this or something, it just kind of like trips my mind out. Like, yeah. Because to me, that's not what I always visual no. visualize or was taught that. I, at that rank, you know, at level that you should be acting like. Sure. Um, but, yeah. you know, who am I? I just no, I Well, say, no. And the, the, the thing is, becoming <laughs> a grandmaster, what people don't realize, is it's just not now you're going out there and teaching a bunch of students, you know, stuff like that. Now, people will call you up. Let's, let's say you, when you become grandmaster, they're going to be calling you up. Uh, grandmaster, uh, can, you, can you lead me the way? Can you show me the way? Can you tell me what's right? Can you tell me what's wrong? You know, so, so you're just not um, showing them how to punch and kick. You're a mentor, you're a counselor, you're a friend, you know, you're a father, yeah. you know. I mean, it's, it's all pushed into one thing. And that's what makes a good grandmaster. That, I agree. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, you know, hopefully that, yeah, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, I, I, saying. I wish all of them were that, that way, but unfortunately it's, you see, know, see, like, like with me, and, with me and uh, with me and a great grandmaster Gator, we had a kind of different relationship. That he would talk to me when he wants things done. He would come to me and take care of it. Like when he wanted his tenth, take care of it. I took care of it. With great grandmaster Vargas, even though he's not talking to me again, um, um, 
I would always go to him for advice. Always. And usually, 100% of the time, he's usually right. And sometimes it's hard to swallow, but he's right. And I, I always, always went to him, um, even when he wasn't around anymore, you know. And I hadn't talked to him for like 30 years until I started talking to him again. But uh, I talk to him almost every day, but not lately because, he's, like I said, he's mad at me again. So when he gets mad, you don't talk to me. <laughs> but um, mm-hmm. that's the only sad part about it. But, yeah, he, he was my go-to man. And if, and if he was talking to me right now, it would be the same thing. I, I call him every day, you know. Huh. That's awesome. I, um, I, I, I just hope that – I always hope for um, p- people just to get along and – Mm-hmm. and um come together mm-hmm. it's really depressing when when things get away you know i i mean i understand that families um have problems you know i mean look i, I mean i got two sisters <laughs> neither one of them talk to me i don't know why <laughs> I, I don't, <laughs> don't feel why, bad but, mine don't either <laughs> <laughs> you know but and i, I know country come with a huge family so there's going to be issues here and there but i hope for the best that that you know, they people get them all worked out. And, and, well, um, well, see, with, with my the only thing I regret is uh, um, me and Great Grandmaster Gaylord for the last couple of years before he passed, uh, we weren't talking, and it wasn't really because nothing towards him. It was just the, uh, the I didn't want to be a part of the, the KEA because it was just uh, becoming mm-hmm. a, a joke and stuff like that, and and I kind of pulled away, and that's the only. Regret I really had because when he, you know he passed, I didn't get to talk to him. And then after he passed, he had told Grandmaster Bruno that you know he wanted me to take over the KAA and he loved me and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. It did. He made me cry when I heard that. And so because I, I didn't get a chance to say goodbye to him or you know make amends, and it really wasn't yeah. had nothing to do with really much him. It was just the other the other part of it. I didn't want to be around. You know, I, my um. One of the highlights, besides uh, hooking up uh, with Sigil or texting in front of Sigil, one of my highlights about uh, me or talking, being with Grandmasters, were my favorite was um, Agong Tony Ramos. Yeah. The, um, since I'm in his lineage and my Chan Fa, mm-hmm. um, it, it was always like a, a, a bright sunshine when I'd run into him and we'd get a chance to talk and mm-hmm. and, um, and visit. And, you know, he last time I saw him was 94. Mm-hmm. And um, I had, uh, when I was testing in front of Cedro, um Agam was there, and he came up to me during the break, and he goes, you put Kung Fu in my concentrations. Because <laughs> <laughs> he had his own concentration forms yeah. that, that, that uh, the system, my Chanfa system uh, mm-hmm. we had. So we had 12 monkeys, 14 monkeys, 12 concentrations, and, um, yeah. and, and then a couple soft forms. And um, so his forms were his forms, you know, and mm-hmm. I modified them and put Kung Fu movement in it. And, but he liked it, but it was funny how he said it, you know, and I, that was the first time I actually realized, wow, those were his forms. Yeah. You know, but he was always cool. He was, he was a true mentor. Oh, yeah. Um, Wait, he, you know, he, always he, he was, up and he, was mad, he was, he was, he, he was mad at me because, Eagle. well, he was mad at Eagle me. Eagle Eagle was like, was like that. He was a true um, lifting up spirit. Sure. You know. He, he he got mad at me because um, he wanted me to leave Great Grandmaster Gator and just be totally under him, which I'm we're under, all everybody were all under him anyway. But he wanted me to leave Grandmaster Gator and just be under him, and um, I told him no, I couldn't do that because you know I, I'm loyal to my teachers, and um, after that he wouldn't talk to me no more. So wow. Yeah. I can remember, you know, I, I received a phone call. Here's how it, how it happened. I, okay, from by the time '93 came around, I had stu- studied in Blackton Arnis, mm-hmm. Blackton Chan Fa, and was stu- had studied a couple years of Aikido, and I had, and and I'd been in Wanhao Kundo for ten years, but mm-hmm. but it wasn't ranked in Wanhao Kundo yet, mm-hmm. um, but. But I've been involved with when I when I can go through C4 out and um so anyway um ninety three came C4 out promoted me, saw me teach a class 
and said, wow, you're changed. And he put, so he put me at fourth degree in yeah. 93. And that was my first promotion since my first, since my, my black belt. Um, yeah. So it'd been like, you know, 10 years. And, um, and then, but I had changed. I took a year off and changed everything. Mm -hmm. I had brought in our niece, went up and and my chump and blended it up together. I threw out the Kaji Kimball street sets as far as like number one, two and a grab, sure. number two, et cetera. And I brought in open concept and, um, and brought in my own a method of, you know, of what my students were going to learn. Mm -hmm. Well, um, see, for a while, I was cool with it. Um, see, Joe had heard about it. So I got a phone call saying I need to pack up four students and be in California on Saturday. Um, see, Joe wants to look at you. And I'm like, okay. So I took four students. Um, there and when I got there was when I realized what was going on what was going on was if C. Joe didn't like what I was doing he was going to tell me I couldn't use Kaj Kimmel no more oh, wow. I couldn't use the term <laughs> wow. I couldn't use the term and I didn't know that until I got there so he said <laughs> he calls me up in front of the okay there's a table it's about 40 feet long mm -hmm. And there's 25 ma grandmasters, masters, whatever degrees, sitting there. And he goes, like, up, up, up front. And, um, and he calls me out, and he says, show me everything you're doing from yellow to black. <laughs> and so I, I jumped up eager to, to share, and, um, and I went through it from yellow to black. What I, what I do? And... Then he, when I was done, he said, okay, come up here and sit, sit with us. So I'm look, you know, so I'm walking up there and I'm looking for a, a spot, you know, at the end of the table where, you know, they were all pointing up. No, he wants you up there, mm -hmm. up next to him. Yeah, so that, has, that sounds like sat it. Next to him, sat next to him. And then they were testing my black belt for eight hours along with uh, some other Kaj Kimball people there testing and um, <clears throat> and they had me calling out my students' material. Well, Cedro called out the other people's material. And then during the, during that, um, Cedro talked to me about what if he if what you know what he thought. And mm -hmm. um, all he said was um, he just said uh, he liked what I was doing. I could still use Kaj Kimball, and he gave me my his but I give you my blessing. Wow, that's good. So, so that was um, that was awesome, you know, that it was okay with him to continue what I was doing. Mm -hmm. As far as like changing the, I I took a lot of sets and brought in my own stuff. Sure. But the forms, but the forms I had, you know, left the the monkey forms, even though I revised the concentration forms, mm -hmm. I only slightly revised the monkey forms, um, so you could tell they were still Kaj Campbell, no yeah. matter what. Number nine is number nine. You could tell that was Coach Kimball. Sure, sure, sure. And um, and that's what he told me. Uh, what uh, what held it all together was he could tell, he could recognize Coach Kimball by the forms. Yeah. And um, and, and he could of course, you know, in my street, um, there's nothing I can't anything I do is going to reflect Coach Kimball because it's my root. Well, of course, yeah. You know, and um, and the one I could know that I. It just highlighted it, you know, because of freedom of expression, mm -hmm. and, um, and so there's no there's, there's no pause in what I do. Sure, it's just flowing from one to the next, and um, it just it all works for me, you know, and and it works for my students. That's so great. that was the day. That was August twenty fourth, nineteen ninety four. Wow, that Cecil gave me the blessing. Well, I got I got one more last question for you. Okay, sure. What do you see yourself in ten years doing? Me? Mm -hmm. I, today I only teach one-on-ones, which I love. I, you know, after teaching 30 years full-time, yeah. um, teaching, living life is what I do today. Sure. And, um, and I teach one-on-ones um, throughout the week. It's, I don't book myself over two a day because otherwise I'm back to teaching full-time. Yeah. And, um, I, I, you know, I, I, I like 
the last 10 years I spent with my dog who recently passed away. I know, away. I'm sorry about that. And, um, yeah, that's the hardest thing I've ever gotten over. Uh, I haven't gotten I know. over. I know, I had a Doberman for 17 years. <laughs> Excuse me? I had a Doberman for 17 years, and he was my best friend. Wow. Yeah, my best friend. Yeah, I mean, people that don't own dogs um, can't understand it, but people that do, do you know what I'm, you know what I'm talking about? I know exactly what you're talking about. That's the hardest part. Um, he yeah. was with me all the time, so we lived life, you know, and then sure. he'd go with me, i teach, he'd go, he'd be with me. And, oh, yeah. Um, I like one-on-ones, though, because I could see rapid growth mm -hmm. instantly, because you're spinning the whole hour and a half of them. Yeah. And um, I really enjoy that. So in 10 years, I see myself doing what I'm doing now, living life. Um, of course, always working and training the art. We took um, the whole top half of our house mm -hmm. and made it into a, um, a workout room, a kung fu room with hardwood floors. Yeah, I saw the pictures. Nice. Nice. Excuse me? I seen pictures. Very nice. Yeah, and and, and equipment, and it's awesome. Mm -hmm. So, so either I'm teaching here, or or, um, or I do some one on one at their home. Some people that I teach um, are are learning to art art. They're yeah. learning more self protection and not just self defense. Well, of course. So, so I so I'm I, I enjoy teaching that too. A lot of people. Um, you know, they, we st learn self defense in the martial art, but but we but we don't know about self protection, mm -hmm. and so I, it's great to be able to share that with people on how to secure their perimeters. You know, sure, keep their home sure. yeah. and the steps that one must take to um, to prevent that. So maybe we can do that at another at another time. But the key is oh yeah, we can do we like can do a part two interview. So yeah. All right, well, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this interview up. Um, and I want to thank you again. And remember, my friend, you know, I've watched you for a long time. Don't let nobody hold you back. And you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> nobody Thank you. you back. <laughs> I appreciate that, Grandma Sam. Yeah. You always have my back. Always. Always will, no matter what. Okay, I'm Senior Grandmaster Jimenez. This is Kaja Kimbo Live. We just finished our interview up with uh, Professor uh, Terry Farcloth. Um, again, go to our, uh, our TV show, Contra Kimbo Live, podcast on YouTube. Make sure you watch the videos. Leave your feedback on it. Make sure you hit subscribe. Again, thank you. And I'm Senior Grandmaster Jimenez.